Hello and welcome to Myth Makers. Myth Makers is the podcast for fantasy fans and fantasy creatives brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. My name is Julia Golding. I'm an author, but I also direct the activities of the centre. And today I'm joined by a good friend called Pete Williamson, who is an illustrator and artist. Uh, and we first met because he was illustrating uh, one of my books, which is a rather nice uh, moment for writers when we get to meet other creatives. So today our theme is trying to find a way through the the new the new phenomenon of AI generated images and text because we both have skin in the game, so to speak. So first yeah. of all, what we're going to do is just talk a little bit about what a real life person does as a creative process and then have a look at the issues that the new AI uh, world of creativity presents looking at its pros and cons so first of all Pete um, I you have some most wonderful imagery which I love how would you describe your artistic style and how has it evolved over time um, I mean it's it's described for me as kind of being gothic which is odd I, I kind of understand it but I'm, I've never been a, like a, a goth type person but it's it's very um it's mainly black and white. My, my best work is in black and white. And it, it's quite classic in a way. Um, but I think my favourite illustrator is still John Tenniel, who did the the Alice books for Lewis Carroll. Mm. I, I love that that precision of draftsmanship, but also the strangeness of, of it. I love the, I love the idea of applying that draftsmanship to some two absolutely um, weird and kind of a, a dream-like atmosphere. So I, I suppose I've always been trying to capture that. There's lots of things in the mix. There's um, there's Asterix, there's Wizard and Chips, there's war comics from when I was 11. Um, and then there's American Underground comics, which as a children's book illustrator, I, I tend not to mention because they can be quite... Um, uh, obscene in a way, but the, you know they they were kind of quite influential because they were yeah again they, they're very stylistically diverse and the draftsmanship was always really impressive and I I didn't actually go to college I kind of did that thing of just being in a room and drawing and drawing and drawing until things started to look how I wanted them to look. So did and you have a stage um, when you were actually li literally copying somebody else's style? So yes. did you? Yeah. Um, yeah. What? How? How did that happen? Uh, was it you? Were you copying the illustrations to see how it felt to put the lines down, or were you drawing in the style of Tenniel or somebody? I yeah, I was I was drawing in the style of sometimes very early on copying pictures from from comics. Um, and then just, yeah, and then just trying to apply that style to the ideas I was getting from from the stories. Um, and these weren't things that were being published. They were like your training. Is that? Yeah. Like, your yeah, informal training. So. Yeah. Yeah. So at, at one point I was kind of doing this, the dark stuff that was inspired by um, American alternative comics from the 60s and the 80s. Which had a connection to kind of American alternative punk culture, and at the same time, I was I was looking at children's picture books because I'd got the idea that well, you know, I like taking my love for drawing it has to go into into a commercial area. So I thought children's picture books might be somewhere to go. I'd love Doctor Zeus, and I, you know, I I poured over those picture books for years. So so. For quite a few years, I was—I had these two strands that were separate, where I was—I was learning to draw this really quite cute stuff with lots of little kids playing with dinosaurs in gardens. Yeah. At the same time, doing doing work which, which was perhaps getting quite eerie, and you know, Edward Gorey was a big influence in the early nineties, and then you know, gradually these two strands started to. Um, to kind of gel and move together and I, and I was starting to do work that people have told me since is kind of you know strange they say strange but beautiful or you know it's quite 
weird stuff that's also cute. It, it, it's I seem to have created this um, balance between stuff that can be quite odd but also endearing, which is which has been great on lots of the illustration projects I've had. It yeah, seems to be my voice yeah. in a way. So that ex that was the style that really suited a, a a short series of books I did about a Victorian. Um, little boy called Mel Foster who was like a superhero idea it was like Avengers set back in yeah. um yeah. the Victorian period with the second generation monsters like Frankenstein and um Dracula th those sorts of characters and it was you your pictures had the exactly the right world where it was suitable for children but had that atmosphere and edge and I imagine you can push that either way depending on what your what the product is it's not just one thing but it, it goes yeah. to the scale that you're on I suppose yes yeah yeah so, so I did an exhibition a few years ago where I, I went away from children's books into um but using that style to to um kind of address what I what I what I was saying were, were like adult concerns and not not your normal adult stuff that you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll, that kind of cliched stuff, but but um, kind of anxiety and uh, I, I kind of used the art to look into my heritage, which I found out from being adopted. I'd, I look, found out about my adoption that a, a grandparent had come over from Poland at the start of the Second World War. So it was interesting to... Um, use my children's book art to, to kind of investigate ideas of displacement and and kind of fleeing danger and that kind of idea i was able to use that that black and white style to kind of really go into those ideas and it that was really interesting and then shortly after that i was i was using the sweeter side of my art to you know to, to kind of entertain children in in book workshops and you know they don't want to see sinister no. eerie <laughs> art you know well to an extent they like a bit of it to be honest but yeah but to go and do something that's funny and goofy and daft and and is art as entertainment so yeah. it's nice to have those be able to move between those those poles I suppose yeah and so would you say that there's a distinctive Pete Williamson like if you look at a picture uh, you know you've done it and you could probably somebody else like your agent could say oh yeah that's Pete's that's Pete's work some like in the same way that someone looks at a Rembrandt and says that's Rembrandt and they look at a Van Gogh and they say that's a Van Gogh is there a Pete Williamson indefinable je ne sais quoi about your drawings um, I think there is and I think it's to do with the with the use of I kind of don't stint on the Indian ink. <laughs> that's kind of for, for children's books. There's quite a lot of black in there, and and shading, and and just getting. Someone once said I had, I I created the most colourful black and white pictures she'd ever seen, which, which I thought was really interesting. It's just a lot of use of, of um. You know that lighting effects where things. You, it's kind of odd to describe, I suppose, because it's, it's such a, it's just an intuitive thing by this point. So that's, that's the equivalent of the, the brushwork. But would yeah. you say there's also a um, attitude? I suppose it's the person behind it I'm thinking about here because of the nature of what we're discussing. Would you say there was a approach to characters in particular, the way children are shown, the way dragons are shown, whatever, which has come out of your relationship to the things you're drawing? Yes, I think, to be, I think in a way, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a graphic novel at the moment of a character that I had, was a successful book series a few years ago. And I, I was looking at him earlier and he's basically just like a, a small child that's kind of really on edge in the world. And I wonder, I think I'm putting some, that that seems to be my character, I think. And I, I, there's a, I think I'm, I'm always capturing a sense of perhaps unease. It, it, characters tend to kind of not look that comfortable with what's going on. Part, I mean, partly <laughs> that's because the writers they put me with are also working in 
that area where things are slightly odd and off key mm. and you know the the characters don't really know what on earth that they, they it's almost like a sense of threat underlying the stories so that I think the art in a way captures that there's a sense of things aren't things aren't quite what they're supposed to be I think that's what it what I'm mainly capturing and when I was doing the art pieces I was I was kind of looking into that as well um there was always an element in an image where something was wrong like the I did an image of a, a girl running across a field and it was all in at night time so she was almost like illuminated this lone figure kind of fleeing across a landscape but I, I did the moon black and it just gave it a sense of oddness and things not being quite how they should be so, so I, I, I think I found out I a while ago found out I had ADHD and I think that's been coming through all all these years this sense of not quite things not quite being right <laughs> so, yeah and of course there's that wonderful um Rick Reardon uh when he wrote the Percy Jackson series he made Percy uh an ADHD sufferer because he has the uh the extra sort of awareness of the Greek deity world that's just out of view of everybody else you know yeah, that sense yeah. of being on edge at something you know a minotaur's about to leap out uh which was a lovely way of explaining that um phenomenon so yeah. do you actually when you come down to so we've talked about the attitude and the learning process when you actually come down to the art do you use any um are you a sort of pen and ink scanner in person or do you use an ipad or a, some kind of digital assistance how does the actual work happen it's um i'm very 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 old school it's it's watercolor paper um pen and ink indian ink um and black watercolor and that's it it's uh it, i mean i I, th I worked for an animation company i did a lot of work on um on photoshop and i really found and i think it's to do with the adhd i found it difficult to kind of create because it there were no limits it wasn't you know i've got a, a, a pen and a pencil and a pot of ink and some paper it was it was just enormous what you could do. You could do something, it was wrong, get rid of it, do something else. But also, is, interestingly, you, you'd you have no trace of what you got wrong, so you couldn't work from it. it was, every time you cleared something away, you were on, it was a blank slate again. And I think for ADHD, people having that just limitless choice just means you, you're never really making decisions. It's always, you can always do something else, add something, take something away, change colour. At the end of the day, you might think you've created a, an image and next day you come in, change everything. Whereas, because I'm limited with, with the uh, materials I use, it just feels there's just a focus there, which feels far more, far more creative. Things get done. There's a, you know, the scratchiness of the nib and the, the, the watercolor soaking in and the you know the paper piling up on the desk it, it's far more um physical material so I, i've i've seen all the procreate things coming up on the social media and while it's kind of you know i can be really impressed by it i i've never really felt that i want to go into it it hasn't got that feel for me that i think would work yeah um, yeah it just it seems there's well, too much you're the trust. perfect person to talk to about this then because you're in you are at the end of a scale which is yeah we need the physical hands-on um illustrator approach mm. for you to work so drawing a parallel because we're going to be talking about the sort of uh images generated by ai as well as the text generated by ai so looking at the sort of parallels from my rise to be a writer um it started off Similar to you, obviously, um, a primary school, we're all taught to paint and we're all taught to write, hopefully. Um, yeah. And for me, that initial phase was very much, um, I would write what I was reading. So if I was reading the Narnia books, uh, I would then write stories like the Narnia books. If I was reading the Famous Five, I would then read, would write stories like the Famous Five. And, you know, that's the sort of, mm. this is the tween, you know, the preteen stage. 
Um, and then I carried on reading and writing, but it then became more like an academic reading and writing, writing essays, you know, the all that stuff. I wasn't particularly writing so much in my late teens, early 20s. And it wasn't until I had a bit of a gap later on in after having um, a child that I actually started writing again because I had an audience. I was doing writing for academic purposes. I was doing writing yeah, for a work yeah. context, but the actual creative let's tell a story hadn't been happening. Um, and so looking at the beginnings of my professional career, I was already moving towards my own voice. I wasn't copying people. I got ideas from reading other things. And very often they would be, I don't want to do that. So what do I want to do? It's mm, like it's quite yeah. useful to have, I don't like that style. So actually my choice is, mm. and I'm I'm a, I'm a terrible person for, if I don't like how a film finishes or how a TV series is going or a book, I will say, no, what should have happened? <laughs> Actually, one of the things I was I was yeah. trying my um my brain out on was the Harry Potter series because that came out quite slowly, if you remember. Yeah. And yeah. we all knew that there was going to be, I don't know, seven books or something. So I was always rewriting the end. I was thinking, okay. well, how's it going to go from here? <laughs> yeah. Um excellent. You know, what what what's the story logic? Because there is a certain a sort of sum underneath a, a story. Mm. Um another podcast is was I right or not I, you know there are, um I got a couple of key things right uh, anyway um so I was sort of inspired by the work of other people and of course because I give so much of my time to Tolkien I was very inspired by the Lord of the Rings but I've never sat down to write a Lord of the Rings lookalike you know a sort of in the world of or a sort of sideways step where it's really Lord of the Rings, but I just give it my own names. I'm not I'm not interested in doing that because the sort of Tolkien world where you create something so at such detail is not where I am creatively. I like to tell lots of stories in lots of different places, lots of different reasons, historical, contemporary, and so yeah, on. Yeah. Uh, so though you can be inspired by other artists, other writers you don't necessarily want to be them. <laughs> you want to no. do what they're doing in the sense of produce your own work, but you don't want to be them. So I'm not copying them. Uh, so my other hero is Jane Austen. I don't want to write a Jane Austen novel. Um, so when I am writing, the actual, after years and years of reading of stories, doing my own little efforts when I was younger, when I actually can't come to writing, I'm fairly straightforward in how I do it. I do write straight onto computer rather than longhand. Mm. Um, but because I know how to touch type, I'm not thinking about the mechanics of writing in that way. It's as though it's going straight from my brain onto the screen. There is an awareness yeah. of the yeah. physical. Uh, I don't have that, you know, The I'm sure some people are inspired by the actual movement of the pen. That's not something that matters to me. Um and the place I'm in in my head when I'm writing feels a bit like meditation or prayer or something. It's a kind of space where I can lose sense of time. So if I'm really in a story, I can be sitting very still. It's terrible for health. <laughs> I can be sitting really yeah. still yeah. and the whole afternoon will go and something yeah. breaks in and you think, where have those three hours gone? Um and that's the most creative space I'm in. And do you get like that when you're really in a picture that there's a sort of a, almost like a time just stretches and just disappears. The boundaries disappear until you're aware of it again. Yeah, it's um, it's quite a magical space, isn't it? Mm. You're in this. I, I mean, the, the antithesis of that is when I'm having difficulty drawing something yeah. and yeah. spend seven seconds drawing a line and then feel exhausted and have to go away and have a cup of tea but but, but that yeah when you when you spend hours I, I was doing it last night actually I, I just spent hours you know sort of with a, a Philip Glass opera on in the background so that was just churning away in the background and it just mm. I just spent hours kind of working on the project I'm, I'm doing now and then suddenly it's kind of you know you look up it's it's quarter to ten and then you look up again and it's it's past 12 
Mm. But and you, yeah, and, and and just kind of create. They're seeing that your creation kind of just emerge in front of you. There's just something really hypnotic about it as well. When it when it's going well, I think. Yeah, when it doesn't go well, then it then becomes the insult of the inanimate object. So, mm. you know, the pen that breaks, the computer that is updating and won't let you in or has lost your stuff. You get really annoyed, I find. Uh, probably it's just me. But I get really annoyed with inanimate objects who were standing in my way because everything goes wrong. Then you stub your toe. Then, you, you know, it's yeah, like yeah. the world turns against you. Um, yeah. So that's the sort of experience of us two as creatives um again i'm i'm not using i suppose i'm using a word processor aren't i and i'm using um the internet for searches but i'm not generating any text via you know I, i'm not i'm not using even predictive text i, I hate that um i'm yeah. just working on it's my words going down yeah um yeah. So let's move on to thinking about the potential of the AI uh, artificial intelligence version of what we do. So Pete, um, when I asked you on this, because of your very hands-on um, approach, you hadn't particularly done anything with any AI, um, presumably on both sides, either text or imagery. So yeah. I have used, um, AI generated art for the reason I use it is if for um, web presence so I can't okay. for the the uh the Oxford Central Fantasy we can't afford to pay for bespoke illustrations every time we put up a post but we yeah. may just want something sitting behind our title that says this is about so for today's one um if we were doing an AI generated uh image for sitting behind it on youtube i might put into one of the generators um you know a computer drawing a picture and it would come up with a suggestion for it i enjoy using those uh the images can be quite inspiring so for example today i was um thinking about planning a room inspired by nature yeah. Um, there's, there's a real room which we're planning to decorate and I thought oh well what would it be like if you imagined this room as a woodland grove so you can put into an AI generator a living room like a woodland grove and because it's so random it will yeah. come up with its own version of that and I looked at that and thought well I like a bit of that and I like a bit of that so that's a good design idea and then there'll be another step on from that where I go and think well how do you realize that in the real world yeah um and so i i can use it to spark ideas this it's a bit similar in my mind to those story cubes you get which they use in schools where you have a bag of dice and you shake and a picture comes out of a skeleton a shoe and a uh, i know a, a shepherd and you have to make a story up about it it has that feel it's like a lottery yeah, yeah. um I, it's not so you can i could go and pay a designer but I can't, well, I can't afford to pay a designer, but it also, I want to do the design. And what it's doing is giving me ideas for my design. So in a sense, it's like giving me a paintbrush for me to mm. do something. Um, so it helps my visual creativity because I'm not, you know, I can draw, but I'm not that good at drawing. Um, so that's where it's useful. Uh, now, so there's a world where lots of people are finding a, a word you know a way of interacting with this to just kind of get images that mm. amuse them or interest them or uh, suggest ideas to them so that's one way of doing it then if you let's let's stick with the because there is we could sidestep over to the text but let's keep with the images so i can imagine as an illustrator you're not too worried about people having a go at just spinning the wheel and coming out of images but if i had put in and i haven't <laughs> if i had put in draw me um victorian heroine little girl in the style of pete williamson yeah and it came out with something like your work then you would be worried because that is somebody ripping off 
I know your website or something, which the chat, the bot has gone through and, and stolen. Yeah. I, that does, at the moment, I, I'm kind of assuming that's not going to happen. But if it does, it's kind of, you, because you get, as, as, as a creative person, you get to the point where you have your own voice after, a, you know, it's usually about quite a long time, isn't it? Like just hacking away at, uh, uh, the the kind of uh, the work and just trying to find your voice just you kind of know what you want to be doing but the vo the voice often emerges almost by accident in a way and then for someone just to kind of swoop in and, and kind of go I, I kind of understand it as well like it's the kind of thing I would I suppose when you're young or you, you but I suppose it's different if you want to be if you want to be creative yourself, and maybe I'd say I want a, an image by by one of these cartoonists I was really into. If I put that into one of these programs and and it created something, yeah. I said, yeah, I was, it's, it's interesting. I, was, I guess the issue is if people are, are just kind of taking a facsimile of your style and perhaps using it to to make money. I mean, I, I don't know if I'd be that bothered if someone did it just because they liked my work and they they wanted to use it on a website or something like that. I wouldn't have much of an issue with that. It would almost be a, a compliment. But I, I guess yeah. it's when, you know, when it gets translated into a, an advertising campaign at some point and you're not, you're not seeing any any benefit from that. I suppose that's yeah, because, that's because quite a, a good that's a good example because that's a bit stuff. like fan fiction for me. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, I've had various books where their fans have written continuations or stories in the world of, and uh, absolutely, you take it as a compliment. I think mm. it clearly clearly seems wrong to me to do that for somebody yeah. whose work is in copyright. So. Yeah. Um, for live so is is it for illustrators the same as um writers it's uh, in this country it's life plus 70 i think but, so yeah 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 so if if it's van gogh for example i think putting um you know draw me a i know a ford motor car in the style of van gogh something which he wouldn't have done mm. but you think oh wouldn't it be fun to see what it would be like to imagine he was doing that seems just playful and fine because van gogh is not under copyright yeah. um well also he's so well known that you you know he's not an obscure artist who you're kind of like preempting any success that they might have ah that's you, a good you, point too mm. and kind of taking their voice before they really get it out into the world with van, van gogh you're just it's a cultural reference point isn't it you're kind of applying that to like you say a car or yeah, yeah, a, a product. I guess it's that that difference of if he, someone would do that because people know what Van Gogh looks like, wouldn't they? So there would be that that incongruity, which would yeah, would, which would it's, give it's, the work a bit of oomph, I suppose. So I think we can say that because I'm trying to sort of feel my way to what I think eventually the law should be, or and what mm. what people who care about this should be doing, that when there is a clear intention to rip off the style of somebody who's who has either they're undiscovered or they're they've got some kind of copyright that seems to me clearly unfair um when you know it's unfair to let a a bot sort of it's like a parasite then isn't it it's, yeah. it's living yeah. off the work of other people um when it's something images that are uh not protected by copyright and are just in a melange I don't. I think it's fine to sort of say, you know, draw me a, a modern girl in the style of ten year old Alice. You know, why not? It doesn't matter. Yeah. Ten year old doesn't care. <laughs> yeah. He won't mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there is there is an issue here where it's less clear um, how the image has been generated. So I, I before this we were reading some articles up in this mm -hmm. area, and back in January. Um, one of the AI image creators was taking being sort of challenged by Getty Images for its use of photographers and illustrators' work because obviously Getty Images is like a 
a library of work and you pay to use an image. Um, yeah. So the, the fear is that people whose income is, is uh, by having their photographs or their illustrations used uh, and getting a, a royalty for that or payment for that uh, are missing out because they're being uh, ripped off by the, as in like ripped in the old sense of, you know, when we used to rip D CDs back in the day, you know, that idea, the pirate yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, so they're pirating the images, but then they're putting it in one big digital cauldron and swirling mm. them around and using it to paint new pictures. So it's very hard for Getty Images to say, well, that pixel in that thing is actually taken from this image because yeah. it just isn't traceable. So what do we what does the world do about this? I, I'm not expecting you to have the answer, Pete, but what does your gut <laughs> tell you about the fairness of that and the unfairness? Because those who are defending AI are saying, well, it's just the same as uh, you creatives when you are learning something, you go and look at this picture and you look at that picture and it and a digital brain the they, the artificial intelligence brain is doing the same thing it's um it's learning from these images and using that to present a new vision of its own i find it really um yeah it's really it's really tricky isn't it i mean you saying about ripping CDs reminded me years ago, 20 years ago or something. Um, I kind of knew musicians and they weren't, they were musicians who were just, you know, they weren't very well paid at all. And they would kind of just swap pirated CDs, you know, and it, and it was that they, they knew, you know, it's obviously illegal on a certain level, but if they, they didn't do it they wouldn't be like hearing what they wanted to hear and they would they wanted that information to put into their creative stew and i wonder even though that's the musicians were losing money from the cd sales i suppose it, it's it's almost it was going on to create something else but then with the ai there aren't individuals the whole point is it's not an individual human being is it just taking this melange of imagery and creating something new it's although there, there's obviously money being made somewhere yeah so to to but um, do you go to those people and do you do you have do they have to pay into some kind of i'm not i'm not sure i know what you mean it's like you, you couldn't pinpoint the pixel that you'd taken from Getty that was in an image that maybe the Guardian or one of the Times had used, you know, they'd used an AI image, sourced it, used it for an article. Yeah. So, so it's entering, it's put, being put into the marketplace, money's being changed hands. Yeah. But and really you do actually see more and more, if you look at um, newspapers, um, I've noticed, they're not necessarily saying, but there are more images I know are easy to create on uh, these image generators. So, for example, if you want to do a political image, say you wanted to do yeah. a, comment, a commentary on the recent visit of um, President Xi to Putin. I think this is the image I've got in my head. Mm. Um, I saw an image of that in that sort of uh, Stalin period, you know, that that art they had then of the worker with the red flag oh, yeah. flying by. I, it's probably some yeah. term. That modern style they had in the 20s and 30s. So the mm. image was of the the two meeting in that style, which you could do very easily by running it through an image generator because you would just reference the style, the people, and off you go. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's – would they have employed an illustrator to do that or is it just a quick – I don't know. Um, maybe not, but it's a quick way of summing up the con the the way they're presenting the art you know it chimes with what the article was saying about the friendship that was going on there um the real politique behind it yeah so yeah. the creativity there resides in the person or the the team of people who are programming these so let's you mm. know these programmers are creative there are creatives yeah. on that yeah. side of it um i don't think yet we've reached a point where the ai itself is sentient so 
it's even though it's extremely clever and a bit black boxy and that you don't know what's going on i don't think we're yet giving it copyright of itself no, no. um I mean, there's a whole cases about this happening in law. But you've also got the person who's saying, well, in order to illustrate what I'm writing here as a journalist, I need this kind of image. And so he's he or she is putting that they have found a, a way of describing their idea into one of these image generators to get the illustration for their piece of short term jur journalism. Yeah. That's you know, yeah. I can see why I can see why someone goes that way. Um, because we are now an increasingly visual culture, and so that's the thing, isn't it? That's a big part <laughs> of it. But that there, there needs to be this constant flow of, of new imagery, and there, with without budgets, the the budgets aren't there for it. But there just needs to be like newspaper cartoons that make you kind of go, oh, yeah, hmm, and then you turn the page and forget about it. So you're not going to pay Chris Riddell a, a thousand pounds or what? I don't know what he gets, but I mean he's a great political cartoonist, but mm. you, he can't do something every day. You, you know, it's they are going to just be yeah, like you say, they're just going to be going and putting this like an art director. I guess he's got is putting what they what they want into these these programs and and kind of there's a bit of kind of aesthetic judgment going on when they choose which one they're going for but but it's, but it's very it's, minor i mean um yeah. i think we should so i'm saying about the creativity of the person thinking it it's only a very low level creativity it's nothing of the yeah. engagement of of something that you do it's a very different it's more like um I don't know, paint by numbers or something. You, you, it's something where you're, you, you, the actual picture is being formed by something else and you're just putting in some rules. Um, yeah. But there's, all, there's always, there's always, um, this has supercharged it, but there's always culture by numbers, isn't there? There's always, there's always films, that, you know, B-movies that were just, it has to do this, this, this. You, you make, the, make the film and you put it out and you, uh, we, you know, I think we have books as well. We, do, we were mentioning the romance uh, genre. That there are areas of culture which are like which kind of thrive on being formulaic. Yeah. And and, and there, there are there is areas where people are far more. You know, it's far more kind of an artistic vision. But there's so much of culture by numbers, like you know, pop music. Your novels and you know that kind of thing that it may i'm not sure it feels like it isn't going to go away but it feels well, like yeah no, that's the other there. yeah that's and the other point isn't it we, we don't want to be the frame breakers you know the luddite so if you're looking at this sort of the 1810s there was a whole problem of the uh, mechanization of the weaving industry mm. so um the cottage industry of home weaving was going moving into big factories and there were people going around smashing up looms saying um, this is taking away the livelihoods, changing the pattern of our work, which it was. Yeah. Uh, wasn't yeah. it terrible that they had invented the power loom? What was wrong with somebody sitting at home with the treadle doing it at home? And, well, you know, tw 200 years on, what, where are we now? Well, you, you still have people who do craft weaving, high spec weaving. Yeah. And in a sense, it's, it's much more valued and venerated but we're probably all wearing clothes made in huge factories somewhere. I don't even know where. Um, no, no you know, exactly. So not. the Luddites didn't win. Um, so are we... No, well, there, there's still... There are people doing hawkature around there. There's Savile yeah. Row. There's still that very rarefied area. But so if, if we're going to sort of surf this wave of mm. perhaps we could do the, the the text thing in a sort of second part of this. So let's finish with the imagery. So this avalanche is here. We're all riding this wave. The kind of line that I've been thinking, let me test it out with you. because I've been trying to think what is fair. So when I work with an illustrator, I absolutely know that it's a conversation, a creative conversation between myself and the illustrator they bring something else to the process. They bring their vision, 
uh, they bring brilliance of their unity of how they draw. So each of their yeah. pictures looks like the same, you know, it looks like the last one, but is new, you know, it's part of a series. Um, if I was doing that with AI art, there's all sorts of problems about AI art because it doesn't understand the picture it's drawing. A an AI doesn't know what it's drawing. So um, you can often tell AI art from hands. It has no idea yeah. how to attack, how to approach hands. So see how my mm. hands are like this. Mm. A lot of hands in photographs look like this. So an AI looks at that and thinks it's one hand. Yeah, or, yeah. And, and then you'll get strange conformations of hands and, and table legs. It just can't, it doesn't understand what it's drawing because it's not a thing to understand. So there is a real problem about AI art actually being superficially attractive. But when you look at the details, so much is wrong. So it's a weaker tool from that point of view. So yeah. would it be fair to say that we should value the expertise of the designers and the illustrators for, um, you know, bespoke, like proper, long-lasting work, ephemera, which, you know, is, is to illustrate an article about something political or today's posting on Facebook is less of an issue. I mean, good, yeah. I don't, yeah, I feel in a way it's not, it's, it's difficult because pe I think people will always respond to the human feel in, in art and culture and, and just in life, you know, you, I was talking to a partner, and you, you know, you get on the phone and you will talk to a machine, you just want to say hello to a human yeah. person and yeah. and have a chat and or, and fi fix something very quickly, but you talk, you're going through, you put it being putting it to a box and then the box is getting ticked and I think this human feel thing is really important when you when you're illustrating you when I illustrate a character it's never the same page by page I, I kind of I slightly I'm slightly getting it wrong or I'm, I'm emphasizing one feature over another or from what the character's supposed to be doing I'm I kind of almost subconsciously emphasizing uh, maybe a head tilt or a, a hand or or a um, posture. So there's all this all this hu this subconscious human expression that's happening, which it just doesn't seem this AI stuff is ever going to be able to. It's going to look really slick and perfect all the time. It's not, but we're not slick and perfect creatures, and we we know that. And I think we respond to kind of a certain. We, yeah, of, of polish in in our art, but the um, the AI stuff just looks like a lot of that kind of really slick work you used to get in the seventies and the um, the stuff with the, the posters 80s. on the wall stuff. I remember there was quite a few yeah, fantasy posters which really were like that. Yeah, yeah. So so I, I think I think AI will be something that it will become it will be interesting because human beings creative human beings will react to it and and kind of work with it and push it in certain ways and comment on it i th i think it, i wonder if it'll take in the creative world i wonder if it'll just it will just be there as this kind of great kind of blob that just takes up space it, the ai art will illustrate ai articles and it would just be a way of putting adverts in front of people in a magazine or on a mm. you know on a, on a website I, I don't I don't I'm not sure what do you think I mean it's well so none of it has interested me at all it's been in the my peripheral vision it's kind of really slick kind of odd stuff but it's just <laughs> I just think I just think oh here we go again it's kind of tech people thinking they <laughs> you know it's like when they said no one's ever going to, everyone's going to get rid of their books. No one's going to want the book. Anymore. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's and, a good, good comparison. Books got more and more beautiful. <laughs> they just look incredible now. So, so people buy books because it's a beautiful artifact in your house. You know, it's... I think one thing um, I've been doing just as to, to sort of, ex I'm really trying to understand it. Um, mm. And so I was doing a little series of 
putting into um because one of the areas it comes into my work is there's a, a plea for people who do uh cover illustrations that they don't get edged out because um you don't want you could imagine a world where there's a lot of front covers generated by ai art anyway um yeah yeah so i thought well let's see what happens so i i started putting just the name of famous fantasy books into uh one of these image generators to see what would happen and i noticed began to notice a couple of things as i went through it some of the some of the images were actually quite thought provoking and inspiring but some of them showed a bias so i put in there's a philip pullman's book called the firework maker's daughter i put that mm -hmm. in and all of the girls that came back were western yeah right yeah. every single one and in order to make it somebody from an asian background or a black background you had mm -hmm. to put you had to move away from the title and put in you know um use an ethnic description so yeah, there's a, yeah. a bias already in in somewhere way back in the sort of coding imagery the data that's fed it and then the other again on philip pullman i put in the amber spyglass which is the last of his books and because that's a really specific idea and concept the image that was generated was pretty much the image that the designer of the front cover used and they should have been credited. You know, it's the same. I don't know if you remember what the cover is. It's yeah, got the, yeah. yeah. It was a version of that or five, four versions of that. So clearly the AI art had a much smaller data set to go by and has come back with something much more derivative. So yeah, it's yeah. not, um, in terms of a paint box, imagine like I'm on massive paint box it is not a neutral thing, but we may be mistaken for thinking it is. It's got uh, all sorts of weaknesses. So we have to be very knowing in the way we use it, but positively. So it's got lots of weaknesses yeah. as well yeah. as hands. <laughs> I'm yeah. really worried about hands. They're just terrible. I but, know. Yeah. Yeah. And often actually the other thing that's quite sometimes really weird are eyes, eyes and hands. So these are like, mm. you really need to get these right for illustrations. Um, but the other thing that I, on the positive side, that sometimes it produces an image which actually makes my imagination spark. Yeah. So there will be something in it which I could use in my own medium, which is words. I can think, oh, that's a really interesting way of thinking about, uh, I don't know, a world in the sky or, you know, it can give you prompts, a bit like a dream might give you a prompt or looking through well, any 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 source of inspiration. So I could see it being used as a prompt for creativity. Yeah. Um, and I think it always we need to have a way of admitting that we're using it. Yeah. As well to yeah. show that because you can imagine there'll be artists now <clears throat> who will be able to pass off their work, say, "Oh, I drew this," when actually what they mean is I I inputted a command into um one of these online ai generators and you know i can yeah. see there's going to be a bit of fakery going on yeah I, I, earlier i was wondering if it would be a, a bit like muzak yeah, remember there was there were corporations yeah. that would create muzak and it would just be filtered into workspaces and off and it would be filtered into commercial spaces just as a just as a uh, just to fill the space where they thought music should be, but they didn't want to use real music. And, but, and then musicians and artists responded to the concept of music and took it into their own work. And it, it because it was something in the in the cultural environment, like like AI will, is. I, I'm just looking at it in terms of how will it be used? How will creative people use this thing that isn't? There's a, a strange new form of creativity. How will human beings kind of take it into and use use it in their own voice? I'm, I, I mean, obviously it's very early days, but I, I kind of I almost feel like people will get tired of it. You know, it's. So I I think looking I'm, I'm I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would have thought one of the things that you might want to do, you and other image creators the hard way 
might want to do is to be able to remove your images from these data sets that are used to train the uh, AI artist. So that if I put in yeah. a command, draw in the style of Pete Williamson, they can't, or they'll find Pete Williamson in, you know, Denver, who's allowed his stuff to go on, but not you. Um, yeah. yeah. So that you can actually protect your creativity. So Getty Images, they should be able to remove all the images that have gone online. There should be some way of coding behind that to prevent it being used. Um, I don't know if that's, I don't know if technically that's possible, but that would seem to be fair because it's then, there are loads of imagery which are not protected by any copyright, which is absolutely fair game. People want it out there to be used and yeah. reinterpreted and, you know, um, but the things which people are earning their living on should be able to be kept out. So if a, there's a Van Gogh alive today, his style or her style doesn't get ripped before they've got anywhere. Yeah. That would yeah. seem, you know, should we, should we um, have a little a pause there? Uh, or sort of yes. put a pin in uh, illustration and we'll move across now to look at um, the issue that on my side of this, which is the actual text, the chat mm -hmm. GPT, can yeah. you basically how that whole side of things has suddenly exploded in the last few months. Yeah, definitely. Okay. <laughs>